Hi there. Uh, so I wanted to make a video that kind of offers a brief overview of the classical psychedelics uh, before I go into making videos on the kind of cutting edge research that's happening uh, with these compounds. So psychedelic means mind manifesting. Now these compounds got this name because they have profound effects on the contents of consciousness. So they're sometimes referred to as hallucinogens, uh, which means hallucination generating, or entheogens, which means generating the divine within. So I'll be focusing on what are known as the classical psychedelics, and are also sometimes called the serotonergic psychedelics, uh, because they exert their effects primarily by acting on the serotonin system in the brain. So serotonin is a chemical that's produced endogenously, uh, that is within your body, uh, and it functions as a neuromodulator, which means it can modulate the brain activity in a variety of ways. So serotonin is created from tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid that you get in your diet, especially from foods like bananas and chocolate. And then enzymes in your body, they modify the tryptophan molecule uh, to create tryptamines. So serotonin is a tryptamine, uh, as are many classical psychedelics, uh, but other ones are classified as phenethylamines. So the tryptamines, they share a chemical resemblance with serotonin, uh, while the phenethylamines, they more closely resemble dopamine, which is another neuromodulator. However, all of these compounds act on a variety of receptors in the brain, but they all seem to exert their effects primarily by binding to the serotonin 2A receptor. So let's start with the tryptamines. You have N-N-dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is also known as DMT for short, uh, and that's a tryptamine, <laughs> so if you need me to tell you that, uh, and it's produced endogenously in your brain. It's found in many plants and exists in every ecosystem on Earth, uh, although its function isn't really known. So ayahuasca, that's a psychedelic brew that comes from South America and contains DMT, uh, which comes from the leaves of the chacruna shrub, uh, which is also known as Psychotria viridi. Uh, and the ayahuasca vine, Banisteriopsis capi, uh, is also brewed together with it, um, and that's also known as uh, the vine of the soul. That's the translation of ayahuasca. So DMT is broken down in your stomach by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, MAO, uh, and that prevents the DMT from being orally active when you consume it. The ayahuasca vine, that contains three harmala alkaloids, which are harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine, and they act as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, so they inhibit the activity of the enzyme that would otherwise destroy the DMT, and that prevents the DMT from being broken down, allows it to enter your bloodstream and cross into your brain and have its psychoactive effects. Pure DMT can also be isolated from plants and then vaporized and inhaled, and this is a practice that's been going on in the West since about the 60s. So whereas the slow release of DMT over a course of hours with ayahuasca has been widely reported to allow people to undertake powerful therapeutic work, the smoked DMT experience produces a sudden loss of contact with reality and the experience of an entirely different reality, which lasts roughly five to ten minutes. In scientific experiments, DMT has also been delivered intravenously. Another recent Western invention is something called changa, which is kind of smokable ayahuasca. Uh, and that's when DMT is infused into a plant that contains these monoamine oxidase inhibitors, these Himala alkaloids found in ayahuasca. This allows the DMT to be smoked instead of vaporized and for the experience to be slightly extended due to the action of the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Psilocybin, the active compound in magic mushrooms, is broken down into psilocin in the body, which acts as a kind of orally active psychedelic that is very similar to DMT in structure. So psilocybin's effects typically last four to eight hours, and at moderate doses it produces euphoria, hallucinations, and at high doses it can produce mystical unitive experiences, uh, as I described in my last video. And at very high doses, it's been reported that it can replicate the reality switching effects of the smoked DMT experience. 5-methoxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine, or 5-MeO-DMT, not to be confused with NN-dimethyltryptamine or just DMT, is another recent psychedelic that was first discovered in the 60s. So like DMT, it's found in plants, animals, and in our own bodies, and is usually acquired from the dried venom of the Sonora Desert Toad, uh, which is smoked. And this produces an intense mystical experience that can last for several minutes and is described as a kind of union with the white light. LSD can be tricky to classify uh, as it's a semi-synthetic compound derived from ergot, a rye grain fungus, uh, but it's definitely tryptamine-like in its structure. LSD's effects are similar to psilocybin, uh, but the effects have typically last from 8 to 12 hours. It has more of a stimulant effect than psilocybin, and has been reported to be widely used in Silicon Valley 
uh, in small microdoses to improve, improve productivity because of the stimulant effect that kind of increases creativity and concentration reportedly. Now, the phenethylamines. Mescaline is a phenethylamine. Uh, it's found in peyote, San Pedro and Peruvian torch cacti, uh, and has effects lasting between 6 to 12 hours typically. Now, the effects of mescaline were described in Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception, uh, and it was kind of the first psychedelic to come to the attention of the West in the 20th century before the discovery of LSD. Now, the 2C family of chemicals are all phenethylamines as well. The name was coined by Alexander or Sasha Shulgin, the chemist who synthesized the majority of these substances for the first time. I can't find the origin of this quote, but I heard someone in the field remark once that there are only two beings that were capable of inventing psychedelic compounds, God and Sasha Shulgin. Shulgin wrote a book called Phenethylamines I Have Known and Loved, PCAL, uh, where he documents his synthesis and self-experimentation with this class of compounds. Uh, he also wrote a book, Tryptamines I Have Known and Loved, or TCAL, uh, and the parts of these books that involve the production of these chemicals and the effects they had on him are uh, freely disseminated uh, by Arrowhead.com. The 2C family of chemicals have effects that combine the hallucinogenic and stimulant effects of LSD with the euphoric effects of MDMA, uh, with a kind of range of duration lasting between 8 to 24 hours, depending on how it's taken. Now, MDMA, which is the active compound in ecstasy, that's not a classical psychedelic, but it's increasingly been referred to as one as it has a similar kind of therapeutic profile to compounds like psilocybin. MDMA is an amphetamine, and it produces euphoria, increased empathy, and feelings of social connectedness that can last from three to six hours. Uh, while I'm mentioning non-classical psychedelics, it's worth mentioning that ketamine, which is a central nervous system depressant uh, and acts by inhibiting the function of NMDA receptors, which are the main uh, receptor in the brain involved in learning, uh, Ketamine is a powerful dissociative and is being found to be very helpful in treating depression. And ibogaine is an alkaloid that's found in the African root iboga, and that's proven to be very effective in treating addiction. Finally, uh, an honourable mention goes to salvia divinorum, or divine sage, uh, a strange plant which when smoked at high doses has similar short-lived reality switching effects to DMT, but with highly negative mood states. Surprisingly, salvia divinorum exerts its effects via the kappa opioid receptor, not the serotonin system. So the mu opioid receptor is thought to be involved in the addictive effects of opiates, while the kappa opioid receptor is thought to be involved in the unpleasant effects of opiate withdrawal. And you can find plenty of videos on YouTube of people smoking salvia and having a horrible time. As a closing anecdote, I had dinner a few years ago with Brian Roth, who's the professor who figured out how uh, salvia works in the brain. And he told a story where he just found that uh, salvia seemed to be working via the kappa opioid receptor and was so shocked that it wasn't working on the serotonin 2A receptor that he contacted the guy who he got his salvia from, who was this guy who ran like a legal high shop, and told him this. And the supplier was very surprised as well. And so he said in this email to him, look, Brian, I'll do an experiment on myself. I'll take a chemical that blocks the kappa opioid receptor, then I'll smoke a bunch of salvia and I'll see if it blocks the effects. If it blocks the effects, then we've confirmed that it really is working via the kappa opioid receptor, as surprising as that seems. So Brian, being a very, you know, uh, important tenured professor, replies saying, please don't do this. Um, you know, the human experiments have to go through ethical oversight committee. This takes months and months, but it's really the way this has to be done. Please don't do this. And so he goes home. And then the next morning he comes in, finds an email from the guy on his desktop saying, Hi, Brian. So I did our experiment last night, uh, took the chemical, and it totally blocked the effects of salvia. So I've confirmed that salvia does work via the kappa opioid receptor. So Brian called in all of his lab into, uh, into his office to look at this email uh, and told them that this was the only time in their career they would have a hypothesis on Monday afternoon and have it confirmed in a human on Tuesday morning. <laughs> and as a scientist, I can tell you that's, that's pretty wild. That doesn't tend to happen. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind tour of classical psychedelics. Um, it's by no means exhaustive. Please leave me comments if there's anything you want me to kind of focus on more in uh, next videos or anything you think I've, you know, any massive oversights, things I've left out. Uh, yeah, and thanks for watching.